Sure. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Mosaic Podcast. Today, I am supremely excited because I have a woman on today that I'm going to be speaking with that I met through a friend is too strong a word to say, but through an acquaintance, I had this fellow on my podcast and we had such a great podcast. He said, you, you should definitely have this woman that you're going to hear um, on your podcast. And I thought, okay, great. And they're a part of a group called Awarepreneurs. And I think that that's where he knows her from and he runs that group. And, um, but I had a conversation with her just out of the blue. We sat and had a short conversation and it was one of those conversations that you don't want to leave. You just know that you're taking somebody's time, but you could speak with them for hours and hours and hours. And um, I just want to let her know now and to let you know now as I introduce her that I was really touched by her conversation. And even more than that, I was touched by her kindness. Um, so it's really my honor to introduce you to someone I'm only meeting myself, really. I, I, I know her very briefly, but the experience of meeting her has been so pleasant that I just want to introduce the people that I love to the people that I love. And so let me give you a little bit of background of how this is, of who she is, and then we'll just jump right in if that's okay. All right. Um, Seema Agarwal probably didn't say that right, but Seema Agarwal is a mystic truth seeker and transformational catalyst. She cares deeply about the individual well-being and shaping of our collective consciousness. She started her professional career as an engineer, but soon realized that her inner devotion and love towards the divine outweighed everything. This love led her to a journey of healing, awakening, and weeding out that from her consciousness, which kept her separate. The never ending quest for understanding life's mysteries brought her to many long, long spiritual journeys in India and in the West, where she spent considerable amounts of time learning the different streams of wisdom, everything from yoga to breath work, to mantras, to system constellations, to ancestral healing, energy healing, evolution, astrology, human design, and gene keys. Like what didn't she learn, okay? <laughs> uh, but, but I want you to know that she comes with a, with a tool belt on her of things that really can do amazing things for you. At some point in her journey, all of her, all the personal and collective suffering within her exploded and she became at peace with the world. Life with all its ironies has been humbling and beautiful. And what I want you to feel today with Seema is hope that you don't have to suffer that there are people like her that can actually do some work that is not only from this place, but from ancestral places, from other places that can actually release a lot of the suffering and pain and, and um, stuff that's going on. I'm going to let her explain it to you better than I. So we have her website here, which we're, we're going to want you to go to, and it's www.interconstellations.com. There's a direct link to the ancestral healing work that she does that, that's a, a longer link, but it's innerconstellations.com, constellation healing sessions, and all of that you don't have to get right now. It's all in the show notes. You'll just be able to see it as we do it. So without making this into a monologue, Seema, welcome to the Mosaic Podcast, and thank you so much for sharing of yourself with our people today. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, and I'm honored and touched to be here and to speak, you know, with the community that you love. Well, it, it is, it is my pleasure. Um, so a lot of what the mosaic is about, this podcast is about, is these pivotal moments where something just shifts. And normally I start out asking about your family and maybe I'll get back to that right now, but there's something that's so intriguing to me that you started your career out as a, as a engineer. And then something happened where you felt this incredible love burning up within you. Can you, can you talk to me and as much as you can bury, burrow down into that moment mm -hmm. 
because I'm sure there are a lot of people that are doing work that have, that feel some sort of love for the divine. Yeah. But don't have the courage necessarily to shift. What happened for you in that moment? Um, you know, you could be, one could be doing any kind of work and be in love with the divine and have the divine be with you in that work, doing that work, because we are essentially divine. So the more you realize yourself, the more you realize that, you know, it's the divine doing the divine. So from that perspective, I think it's okay, regardless of the professions that we are in. Uh, but sometimes what happens is that we don't really know who we are at a young age. Our societies, our communities, our education system, our wisdom bodies of the world are so disconnected from, you know, our emotions and our feelings and our body and the indigenous wisdom. The world in some ways is so much more colonized that our approach to life sometimes is transactional. And um, is you know it's taken from the approach of what path could get me fastest to where I want to go, what path can get me the most profit, the most money, the most most everything, and we could be losing bits and pieces of our innate gifts, bits and pieces of the purpose that our soul came here to earth to experience, and if we do find ourselves in that situation, then we could end up being in professions which are so much more contradictory to our innate nature. Yeah. And that's, that's what, you know, in some ways happened with me. So even when I was doing my engineering school, you know, I used to carry, um, I used to sit with the divine. I, was talk, I would talk with the divine in those classrooms and I would say that I don't understand a word of this. What am I doing here? But I never really dropped out of school. I just continued. I graduated. I not only completed my undergrad, but I also completed my graduation. And the reason I did all of that, I came to understand, you know, most of it much later in life, that I was kind of living a parallel life. You know, I was living multiple lives. I was definitely living one life where I was, um, you know, living the life that I, um, I lived because of my obligation to my ancestors, which I didn't know of. It was all unconscious within me. And then there was another life within me, which was screaming and begging to come out. But I just didn't know how to give it an outlet. And I was managing all of this um, complexities. I'm already a Gemini. And I didn't understand it at that time. I thought maybe, you know, that's how most Geminis are built. We are multiple people uh, jammed in one body. And I thought it was okay. But I did come to a point where it was no longer okay. I just couldn't live like, you know, live that way anymore. Um, and and that, oh, hold yeah. on one minute. What happened at that point? Like, what does that point look like where you're going along? You don't really understand why you're doing what you're doing, but you're just yeah. doing it. And then all of a sudden it gets to that point because I bet there are some people listening that are probably at that point right now yeah. that, and they're still staying on because the fear of changing or fear of walking away or fear of yeah. doing something different. And we rationalize, which is true. Like everything you say is yeah. so true. We can love the divine wherever we are. But the problem yeah. is living the life that we're living is sort of chipping away all of those pieces. Yeah. And even though we say we can, we don't, right? Yeah. And so what happened in that moment where the chips became so big that you, had a, that you realized that was broken and you had to get out? Um, I mean, you know, I was just, um, I reached a wall. There was nowhere to go from there. Um, and I can't say that something radical happened in life that just gave me that realization. I think that radical event happens in, uh, you know, it doesn't happen quite often. Most often what happens is that we lose bits and pieces over the way until a point it's so late in the game that we have lost so much yeah. that you just, you know, stand up and take notice that where I wanted to go and where I am are two completely different planets. Yeah. And then now, how do you make sense of it? And how do you, you know, come back to where you want to go? I think that's what happened in my case a little bit. And um, a little bit also, you know, I think bulk of it was also because of the life journey that I had, the circumstances that I had in my childhood. They just led me to go into a journey that wasn't authentic to who I am. Or, I, or it could also have happened that, you know, I lived that life and then I had to pivot 
And I didn't know the time. I lost, I think our, our bodies and our souls, they speak to us. And I'm pretty sure that they did speak to me that it's time to pivot. But I didn't understand the wisdom of pivoting much later in life. So I think some of those happened. So you allude to life circumstances that happened as you were growing up. What were yeah. those life circumstances that put you in a place to take you in the direction that you went? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I grew up, um, I mean, my, my first half of my life happened in India. And uh, life took my father away from me just a couple of months before I was born. So I grew up in an environment. I grew up not having my father around me. Mm. You know, his death had created a vacuum um, in our family. And um, I kind of thought at that time that, you know, I've never met the man. I don't know him. I've never seen him. So obviously I don't miss him. You have to taste something before you really, you know, uh, like it or miss it or want more of it so so pause for one minute and don't lose your train of thought okay but just because we hadn't met him physically doesn't mean you hadn't met him you probably heard his voice from inside the womb you probably felt his felt his presence around you there was probably something that you had experienced even yeah, but, though it wasn't the physical sight of him yeah but i'm i'm, I'm sharing to you the, the psyche of a six-year-old girl I got you. You know, a five, six year old girl, what she was thinking, how she was rationalizing um, the situations um, that, you know, that I was in. But what did happen was that I always had a burden on my shoulder. I always felt um, extremely responsible. And I always grew up with this feeling that time is running out. Wow. You know, that there was just way too much to do and way too many things to accomplish for the family for my mother, for my sister, and time was running out. So that shaped my life in a way that, you know, I was, um, I was a straight A student, disciplined, focused, everything that an adult is in a kid body, that's right. who I was. Right. And um, I think, uh, you know, my fa because all of those behaviors are so socially laudable that the adults in the room and the adults in most family rooms don't realize that, you know, the kid is losing their childhood in being yeah. that way. Those are acceptable behaviors. Parents take great pride in a child being so disciplined and so focused and all of that. So that happened with me. Um, I pursued the path of engineering um, in India. That was the only path at that time that would give you a very decent job with a very good pay package. And that's what, what I was going for. So I continued in that direction. I hated it. I just pushed myself somehow, um, spent pretty much many, many nights crying, not understanding and feeling dumb, but just pushed myself through it. And then I came to the US and um, I pursued my master's in computer science all over again. You know, if I hadn't done it wrong wow. enough the first time. <laughs> change location, sure. change locations, do it again, right? <laughs> I made sure I did that all over again, you know, so. But yeah. we laugh, we laugh, and I don't mean to laugh at your situation, but we laugh because it's all of our situations. We, we, yes, we basically exactly. all do that same thing. We just yes. find something we don't like, and then yeah. we try and get better at something we don't like by doing more of something we don't like, exactly. but we don't like it. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, exactly. And I was... Um, I was too focused on. Um, I was too focused on loving the family. I was too focused on being in service to them. I didn't really have the concept of the individual self at that moment. Yeah. And um, I continued in that direction. I got a job. I became independent, um, and then I became that much more responsible. And. I loved loving my family. I just loved them. And I yeah. loved taking care of them. I loved seeing that pride in my mother's eye, that she didn't have to worry about things, that she had somebody in her life who had a back. I loved the fact that my cousins could just call me and say, you know, I need this. I want this. Can you guide me? Can you explain yeah. this to me? I loved all of that. Yeah. So I went in that direction. What happened was I started noticing a pattern in my life. I started noticing that any time I wanted to show up to love and serve somebody else, especially my family members, my community, my friends, those situations worked like a charm for me. Somehow, 
I could organize my life force to make those happen. But anytime I wanted to do something for myself, for Seema, for just the pure pleasure of it, or to lay foundations in my own life, I couldn't do it. It just never worked for me. So explain to me, you couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. There was no support to do it. You couldn't manifest I mean, how to do it. You couldn't. Every, I mean, I just, I just didn't have the drive. I didn't have the clarity. Um, I missed most of my bad luck in those, uh, you know, in those spaces. And I also kind of felt a deep internal resistance. Hmm. Like this just won't happen. You know, that's, that's, it was, a, it was a combination of so many things. No, I, I, and that's so prevalent. Like one of the things I noticed that the, the, some of the hardest decisions we have to make are not decisions of right versus wrong. They're decisions of when our core values, when two of our core values, two things we really believe in yeah. are in opposition to each other. Like you have a core value, you love helping your family, yeah. but you also had this core value of, I want to, I want to do something that will be fulfilling to me. Yeah. And, and when you have a battle of core values, somehow in both situations, no matter what you do, somebody, something loses and something loses pretty big. Mm -hmm. And so, and I get what a beautiful soul you are to just say, I want to take care of my family and I love being able to do things for them. And I love being, able... did that set the, the soil in your life for you to always be the one that takes care of other people, but not take care of yourself? Um, I wouldn't necessarily put it that way. Good. Um, and the reason I wouldn't put it that is because that's not what my situation was. It wasn't that I was unable to take care of myself or didn't want to, to, to do things for myself. It was that I was trying, but I kept consistently failing. Right. I succeeded brilliantly in one aspect of life and I failed miserably in another aspect. Of so life. pause with me right there. Why do you think that you were so confident in taking care of other people yeah. and, and had and met with so much failure in taking care of yourself? Yeah. And that's the, that's the million dollar question, you okay. know? Right. And um, so chasing, the, chasing that question, it was a really long journey chasing that question. And I found my answers and answers through healing, you know? Um, so, you know, the basic premise of ancestral healing or systemic constellations is that um, we are not this hyper individualized, I mean, myself kind of a world person. Nobody is, you know, uh, we are living in a living universe and a living universe lives inside of us. So what that means is that our consciousness of our family members, our parents, our ancestors, the country that you know, we grew up in, uh, uh, the history of our land, the history of all things that happened to our people, all of that, nature, everything, all of that consciousness, it lives inside of us and it influences and affects us in more ways than we can ever imagine. So let me just pause for a minute because mm -hmm. I, I can feel my listeners. Some, for some of my listeners, this is going to be a very new concept. For some of them, it's going to be something they've, they've heard yeah. or, you know, or, and understand. And what I want to do for those people who this is a new concept to is to just invite you to stay open. Yeah, sure. Because so many people don't think enough about who they are or what the influences are. I know yeah. in the work that I do, so many people, the first page of my website says, I, would, I, I want to help you meet yourself again. Yeah. And, and what does that mean to meet yourself? Who have you been this whole time? But most of us have been some calculated version, not necessarily calculated by us, of avoidance of looking at who we are by just doing what we do and thinking that's who we are. Yeah. What I want you to do with seems now is to just get a sense mm -hmm. of who you think you are might not be who you are. Yeah. And seeing a world from a different set of eyes, a different perspective, and just try on that what she's saying. Yeah. You know, that's brilliant. And another way I would put it that who you think you are, you definitely are that and so much more. Good. There's so many other stories 
happening inside of you, even if you're unconscious about it. Most of us are, you know, the minute the light switch goes off and you can see it, then you see it not only in yourself, but everywhere. But until that point, you're unconscious of it. But even if you are unconscious of it, there's many other stories are going inside of you. Mm -hmm. So whatever is happening in your life, if something is not going well and if you're suffering, if there's one thing that your listeners can take from you know, this talk is that whatever is happening with, with your life is not necessarily your fault. Mm. It's not a reflection of your bad choices. It's not a reflection of your bad decisions. It's not a reflection of your, um, you know, your, um, your attitudes in life. It's not a reflection of poor judgments. It's not a reflection of all of that. There are forces much bigger than you that are constantly in play inside of us, which influence us um, so to want certain things. You know, we may think that we, you know, this is my authentic desire. Not always, always, that's not always the case, you know. So these forces, they influence us to desire, they influence our desires, they influence us in choosing a certain path in life and that path may bring us a lot of suffering, but that's at that moment in life, that's the only path you can take. So, so let's isolate a little bit so that yeah. we can get, so that people don't think these are, are ghosts or spirits or so, or and maybe they are, yeah. you know, but, but let's try and isolate down for some, for people, some of what those forces might be. Some of them sure. may be ancestral, correct? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. You know, how about I give, how about I give you some basic everyday life examples? Yes. Perfect. Right? Um, so, um, you know, the one thing, so like coming back to my case, you know, what was revealed in my situation was that, um, I was somehow mixed up with my father's role somewhere in my nervous system, in my psyche, consciousness, soul, whatever word you want to use. I was not me. I was not Sina. You know, I, my loyalty, love and loyalty towards my family and my father, you know, entangled me with my, with the empty space of my father. And somehow the system nominated me or I chose to nominate myself to go and fill that role. Yeah. Hence anything that this body wanted to do as the father worked brilliantly and anything this body wanted to do as Seema, as the daughter of the family failed miserably because I didn't have the consciousness of the daughter of the family. I was entangled. I was mixed up, intertwined with my father. So it was easy to show up as him, but very difficult. I had no reference point of what it meant to be the daughter. And so to understand sort of how that happens, can we, can, would this be a good example? Because so many people grow up yeah. in a family and it's assumed they're going to take over their father's business or their, their, yeah. their parents want them to do. And, and so they end up sacrificing what it is they love to go into a family business. Yeah. Is that sort of a, a beginner step that people could say? Because like what I'm wondering is how did your soul, how did your soul unborn yet yeah. get entwined with your father's soul who yeah. left before you came and take yeah. on his duty without yeah. allowing you to take on your duty. Why would your father I want know. that to happen? Why would you yeah. want that yeah. to happen? How does that, yeah. and how do you know those types of things happen? Yeah. So, I mean, that's, the, that's, uh, it sounds pretty crazy, but these are, these are the stories that happen in our everyday life, you know, and this is a wisdom of family constellations. And um, this is, this is, these are ancient old indigenous wisdom. It's not something that I invented. I am a student and I'm a learner yes. and I'm learning. And, um, and I've been blessed with beautiful mentors in my life. And then they were blessed with beautiful mentors. And eventually the, you know, the indigenous cultures is where this teaching is coming from. And um, I, I heard your question about the business and all of that, but let's, let's table that question for a minute. Okay. And let's go into some of the principles of, you know, uh, constellations and ancestral healing. So whatever situation your listeners are holding, they'll be able to map their situation from the systemic lens. So uh, the basic premise of this is that, um, you know, the future generations or children, you know, we are always in deep love and loyalty of 
all the past generations that came before us, including the ones that are transitioned and including the ones that are living. Yeah. Right? So that's one principle. The second principle is that um, the system, which is basically you, your family, your ancestors, your lineage, you know, that system will sometimes choose you to go, some, go through something so that it can bring the system into balance. So for example, if suppose in some generation, there was a brutal, violent murder of some loved one, that is not necessarily going to be reconciled in that generation alone. That energy will echo in some future generations. Mm -hmm. And it will take sometimes a couple of generations to bring that energy into balance for love to flow again in that family, in that lineage. And then um, I see a question coming. Let no, me well, no, you're, you're, you're <laughs> good. No, I just don't want to lose people because some, some of these things, some of these things are so are so, they're so natural to you because you've been engaged in them for. Yeah, for, I know, I know. Yeah, for, let me just explain so, the third point, go ahead, and that's please. where that's where you know things are really common, is um, you know kids very rarely want to grow you know want to have more love and more luck and more more of anything more of happiness more of joy than what their parents and what their family members have had we are wired to be love we are wired to love we are wired to belong we are wired to sacrifice any amount of you know uh peace if that brings us back into the nest of our families or the nest of our communities so if, if um, suppose, for example, a parent, you know, a couple is having a really bad marriage, chances are that the son or the daughter of that couple may end up having a really equally painful marriage. Yeah. Right? Now, conventional wisdom would say, well, you grew up in an unhappy family. You have no reference point. Hence, you made these same bad choices and hence you have the same painful marriage. But what indigenous wisdom or the systemic perspective will say, you know, will look at that situation and what is revealed from that perspective is, well, you're so much in love with your father or your mother, your parents, that you do not want to leave them alone in that suffering. Mm, you're so good. incredibly loyal and your belonging is so strong that somewhere unconsciously, what you're saying to your father or your mother is, I'm not going to leave you alone in the suffering you know what, I'm going to dig a similar hole myself and I'm going to be in it and I'm going to feel the same pain and my lo love and loyalty for you is so high that I'm going to, that I will pay that cost with my own life. So it's a, there are so many different principles here, but this is one of the main principles that, uh, you know, let's talk about it because this is simple yeah. enough to understand and, and it and happens in every day. And I think when we were speaking in our pre-call, because I remember we were saying that you were going to do some, you, I, that I, I had given an example of how it was with my, with my dad, that yes. I had grown up sort of like a mini me of my dad. And my, he, yeah. was, he was a six foot version and I was a three foot version. And he passed away when I was 13 years old. And yeah. he was my idol. He was the one that I looked for. And so, and a lot of the characteristics of who he is or who he was, mm -hmm. I adapted. Yeah. And, I, and I watch myself playing out, even though that isn't at all who I am. I am not some, my dad died with one suit in his closet and a mountain full of debt. Mm -hmm. I was not that person. Money always came very easy to me. But then as I got yeah. older, closer to the years where he passed away, I started to I started to mirror that type of behavior and went yeah. into into a, a sort of a rut yeah. of where money was really hard and then I just didn't mm -hmm. have money and then and and so I think that we follow these patterns that you're yeah. you're speaking about and some and sometimes they're so obvious to us without even being obvious you know mm -hmm. we don't see them as clearly but anybody yeah. looking from outside would say oh I see you're just like you have this model of being a mini me of your dad and yeah. so, but you're not a mini me of your dad, you're your own creation. And so in the ancestral work that you do, does my desire to go into the hole of being where my dad was re release that ancestral or does it just allow me to hand it down to my kids as well? 
Um, I think if, you know, in like in your case, uh, the question, the, 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 the significant question in your situation would be to understand why your father was in that situation. Yeah. Right. So once you start looking at the systemic lens, you know, um, what automatically will flow is love and compassion. If you look at with the systemic lens, if, with that lens, if we look at your life and the way you lost money and the way you um, ended up repeating some of those painful patterns, with the systemic lens, there's so much love and compassion because what you're doing is not necessarily uh, coming from a place of um, not knowing, you know, not knowing and making a bad decision, but coming from love and loyalty towards the father, towards the family, towards the traditions, towards the directions that he was going in. Yeah. Right? So for but instance, if you expand the lens, hold on. If you expand the lens, there are reasons of why he also did what he did. There are reasons of why what happened in his life happened. He didn't look, he didn't look or he life didn't give him the opportunity to look. Let's put it that way. Right? So it got passed to you. But life is giving you the opportunity to examine those patterns. And once you do, you can prevent it from passing away, passing down yeah. to the next generation. And, and that's really the benefit of a lot of the work that you do, because otherwise what happens is we just go generationally one to the next to the next, just yeah. handing down the same story because that's what we, we... So for instance, my dad was not... Um, he didn't really feel like he belonged in this world that much. Mm -hmm. He didn't really care about making money. He didn't really care yeah. about doing all those things. He just wanted to, he loved his family. He wanted to take care of his family, even if he didn't have the money to take care of his family. Mm -hmm. So what happened is he spent a lot of money getting the family things that he perceived, that they said mm -hmm. they wanted. Mm -hmm. But then when he passed, it's all well and good, except when he passed, he left my mom with a mountain full of debt. And she didn't have any idea how to deal with that. And so yeah. she ended up passing away from a broken heart two years later because she was so in love with my dad on the same day. Mm -hmm. So, and then that left us with a mountain full of debt, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, I had, we had family members who yeah. took us in and took, helped take care of that but, and alleviate that. But it still was the sense of, I grew up with this thought being of, of my dad of being this loving man who took care of everybody, but he didn't take care of himself. But then mm -hmm. only a couple of years ago, five years ago or so, mm -hmm. I realized, hold it, that isn't that loving to pass away and leave my, leave my mom with a mountain full of debt. That, that yeah. like it would be far more loving to leave her with a mountain full of, of, of money that she could take care of her, herself and, her, and the kids and do yeah. what she had to do, right? Mm -hmm. So some of the concept, some of the perceptions change as yeah. you go through it. Yeah. I mean, you know, what I would say is the way I would reflect back on that situation is that your father loved your mother. And that's the case. I mean, if this, let this be the situation of any number of fathers in the world. Right, right. Like leaving n number of debt and, you know, again, many mothers going, you know, receiving those, that debt. What I, would, what I have come to realize is that all of those fathers actually did love, even though, they leave, even though they did leave a lot of debt. It came from a place of love, but it came from a place of love towards the system. Unconscious love, immature love, unenlightened love, right? It was all that forms of love, but it was still love because they were not necessarily aware of why they are being pulled into doing some of yeah. those making some of those harmful choices and creating some of these harmful situations for everybody around i'm pretty sure that if they knew if they were given the information if they had the awareness if they were aware of why exactly am i so desperately wanting this um you know this drink of alcohol then you would stop but the question is that we all try to understand the what and we go all psychology all over everything, but very few of us, and this is not a fault again of our own. This is the fault of our colonized systems of the world that we live in. We are so disconnected from nature and from the living aspect of universe that we fail to ask the basic question, why? Yeah. Why did your father make the choices that he made that ended up leaving so much debt? Yeah. Right? Was he atoning 
for some mistakes of some ancestors. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Was he the recipient of a lot of um, inheritance that came from um, harming the earth or harming the environment or harming you know the society of that time? What was the reason that he had to? He was compelled to lose that money. What was so out of imbalance that that was the only way that the system could come into balance by losing all of that money? Yeah, I think that once you ask that question, then that changes the way you look at things. And, and what I love about what you're saying is, in 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 my book, The Mosaic, I tell the story about a boy who loses his parents. It's my story, okay? Yeah. And and the adults tell them their parent when he asks where his parents are, they the adults say they're in heaven. So he sets yeah. out in search of the place called heaven, and the people that he meets along the way are not the shamans and the aborigines elders and the rabbis and the priests and the ministers they're the garbage man and they're the street artist and they're the homeless man and they're the waitress and the gardener and he wonders why am i sitting with these people like what can they show me about heaven yeah. and when he but he says i'm here i might as well listen to them tell their story mm -hmm. and when they tell their story in a hundred percent of the cases he suddenly sees them completely differently than he saw them when he first came up. Yeah. And he realizes that, gosh, I don't see the world the way it is at all. Mm -hmm. I only see the world that I see, but that doesn't mean that's the world that yeah. is. Yeah. And when he realizes that over and over and over again, he looks to the right and he sees a monk unzipping the sky and inviting him to walk into a parallel reality where he meets the wise one. So for those of you who haven't read the mosaic, I would like you to read it, first of all. But second of all, I want you to see Sima as that monk that is opening up a world for you. Because what would happen if the way you see the world, as she said, is a way to see the world. But there's so much more to the world that we don't see. And what would happen if just in listening to this conversation, listening to her speak, suddenly you're flooded with so many more possibilities. I love the benevolence and the kindness of it, that you didn't really do anything wrong. It's not that you're paying off a karmic debt of yourself. It might be, a, it might be an ancestral karmic debt. Mm -hmm. It might be something that is just, you now have a space to heal generations of ancestral uh, damage or ancestral pain and generations in the future of ancestral pain that you might be able to heal in this moment by just seeing the world in a bigger way than you do so let's let's get real close to you now okay, okay? so i can't imagine anybody hearing this conversation and not wanting to get in touch with you and not wanting to do work with you because it's as if we're walking in a world we don't see and suddenly somebody sees something that we don't see that yeah. shines an entirely different light on where we're going. Mm -hmm. So what would somebody, what would I anticipate if I came to you and said, here I am, mm -hmm. like, right? Like, let's unpack all of this stuff. Yeah. Is that, is that, does that take an hour, a day, a year, a lifetime? How, like, at what, what should someone anticipate as they come to you and say, I'm ready to start to unpack all of this so that I can live yeah. finally on my own, on my own space? Yeah. I mean, you know, first thing I would say is that I feel so blessed to be living in this, in these times, but people are really waking up to these, uh, to this deep indigenous wisdom. And there are practitioners all over the world now. And uh, I want to correct a little bit of a point that you mentioned earlier, Good, please. is that I'm not that monk who is opening, uh, you know, that zip of the sky. I'm a student of that monk. I think <laughs> at best, that's all what we all can, you know, aspire to be. So anyways, jokes aside, if, um, if somebody were to start this work, right? I think there are so many different ways one can go about. It all depends upon where one is in life and how much, uh, how much spiritual consciousness healing work somebody has done. If you're just a newbie you know, in the space of really knowing yourself, I don't think you want to pull the curtain all the way up and then be completely you know, imbalanced and not integrate, be able to integrate with what 
you know, is revealed to you. So in those cases, I would say, I would advise is to go with baby steps um, and just get, you know, just attend some introduction, introductory workshops and just get your feet wet and also understand that, um, you know, life and your ancestors are not going to be able to open up all the mysteries to you right away. It's a journey. So the more you go down, deep down into the rabbit hole, more there is to go, right? But you do eventually come to a point where you have taken somebody's hand and have them let, you know, trusted them to lead you. And once you do travel a little bit with that trusted someone, then one is able to walk further on your own. Yeah. If you ever meet somebody who cannot really bring you to a place where they can, where you can walk on your own, my advice would be to walk away from that person as fast as you walk on your own at that point and walk away. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> and and we like just to put it in context of what people know. Yeah. We go to coaches, we go to people to help us to see yeah. things that we can't see. So this is just now, what I love about what Seema is bringing to us here is just exactly what Mo saw in, in, in my book, when he sat with people. Suddenly he saw a completely different reality than the one he saw. Yeah. And even walking through the sky that opened into a parallel reality, he saw another entirely different reality where he met the wise one who was the keeper of the mosaic. There are people that have tools that are able to show you worlds that we don't even see that exist behind the worlds that we see. And if we can just slide to the right some of the things that we think for a little bit and open ourselves up to the possibility and then you just have to feel the person. Do you trust the person? Because I'm sure if Seema does, if you go to Seema to do work, because I know this is true about myself with people that I work with, she's going to take you into some, you have to trust her and you have to develop that trust with her and you have to feel, you have to know that trust is there because she's going to walk you into places that you're going to be scared to go into. Yeah. Uh, and I know that with the work that I do with people and that, and that takes time. You have to find the person that is yours that you feel comfortable doing that with. Because there's sometimes where people don't like me when I go there because they don't want to go into where they want to go in. Like they want to go in, but they don't want to go in, right? And it's scary. Yeah. But what I want you to feel beyond the words of what's happening is sort of the generosity and the sweetness and the kindness of the vibration of the woman that's here with you. And in an hour, we can't do that much. But if all we've done is given you a key to a door that's been locked and you say, let me just see what I would happen if I open this door just a little bit, who would be behind that door? You might meet somebody who can open up a whole nother world to you. Mm -hmm. And for this conversation, even if you understand that there's another world that exists other than the one you see, Hallelujah. Right? Yeah. That's the first step. That's and, always the first step. Right? And then just getting to a place like, so in the work that you do, so now we're not newbies, okay? So now yeah. let's talk to those people who are say, oh my God, I can't believe this. I've been looking for this. This is just like, this makes so much sense because mm -hmm. no matter how hard I try to get this thing off of me, it just doesn't feel like it's mine. Yeah. Um, I think in part of what I, I spoke about is I, something happened to me and I gained, uh, I gained weight overnight and I had all, mm. and I had all sorts of pain in my body that just came as a result, like one minute. It oh. didn't seem like it was anything that I was doing. I was one, one day I was running 40, 45 miles a week and bench pressing 345 pounds. Mm -hmm. And the next morning I woke up 50 pounds heavier and I started to have pain in my body. And it wasn't that I did anything different. It was just mm -hmm one moment to the next. And there was a situation that happened that I felt guilty about for sure. Mm -hmm. But there are those moments where things just happen. Yeah. But there are also those moments where all that can be released. Mm -hmm. yeah. So talk to us about the release process, if you can. Sure. I mean, you know, the release process is, um, it happens in multiple levels. 
So um, I can walk you through a typical session of what a, you know what a Love session it. would look like. So if somebody were to come to my situation, you know, come to me, um, like I can, um, some like I'm I'm working with somebody right now who has who is dealing with a lot of issues in her marriage, right? So in those, if that is the situation that is presented, um, then. In a typical session, what you would do is you would uh, take the high level diagnosis of the person, you know, a high level information of the person. And then um, you try you try to bring the family of that person, the family tree of that person alive. Right. And so the session can happen in groups. And where people can, the bodies, individual bodies of people can hold the consciousness of different family members. Or you could also do it online, one-on-one, -on -one, using objects, right? Mm -hmm. And this is where we get into the space where things are easier experienced and done than expressed. Right, totally. Because it's hard, to, it's, it's hard to put a shamanic psychodrama kind of a process into words. Because the more you try to put into words, the more confusing it may sound. 100%. But the doing of it is actually so much more simpler. But I'm going to, I'm going to do my best effort here. Um, so if, if somebody were to bring me a situation that they are having trouble with their marriage, right? So then there, are, there could be many different things, the different reasons of why is this couple not able to connect with each other, right? What lies between the couple? That is, that is the basic question, right? What lies, yeah. what lies between the couple? Because they have tried loving each other. They've tried seeing the divine in each other. They've tried doing their own personal work. And uh, they've tried, you know, using all the willpower and the power of their mind and everything and threatenings and everything. And if it has not worked, then that means there is something between that couple that is not shifting, that's not moving. So what is that that lies between that couple? Right? So that's the premise you would start with. And you will, you, then you build the family tree of both the wife, um, you know, of both the partners, irrespective of the genders and orientation. You build the family tree, the biological family tree of um, both the partners. And in cases of adoption, you would also build the adoptive, adopted parent uh, family tree as well. And then you try to understand, you try to see if consciousness of either of the family members, of either of the partner's parents or ancestors is what's coming between them. So for like earlier I mentioned that if a parent is having a really bad marriage and one of the kid decides that out of love and loyalty and respect, they are also going to have, you know, an unhappy marriage so that they are connected by the hip, you know, to the parents, then maybe that love and that loyalty is between the, that couple and maybe in this particular case that I'm working, uh, you know, I'm working with uh, this beautiful woman, she doesn't really notice her husband. She just doesn't notice. She's somewhere lost in the past generation with her grandparents and great grandparents and all the events that happened there is not really living in the present and therefore unable to connect with the husband and therefore the husband is unable to connect with her. And so what's the process, if you can explain it or just hint yeah. at it, that you get to that says, Okay, it's not you. It's not your parents. Yeah. It's not your grandparents. It's yeah. your it's your great grandparents. Or, or yeah. how do you I how do you I determine which generation or how many generations back or how many hundreds of generations back or tens of generations back, right? Okay, sure. So, um, assuming it's a group, um, assuming it's a group process or a one-on-one -on -one process. So, I, I is this recording video or is it audio only? Also video, but also video. Okay, so uh, suppose it's a group process, right? And in the group process, you have people, but suppose it's a one-on-one -on -one process and you do it online. And a lot of people also choose to do one-on-one -on -one online yeah. because of safety and intimacy issues yeah. and all of that. So Easy. assuming you are doing, you know, a one-on-one -on -one process, then you would be using something, some object. So this could be one form of the object. It could be anything. Um, I just like to use these objects because then you right. can draw eyes, right? So, um, so I would have uh, like, I would have one partner and then I would have another partner and I will just place them in the field or I would just place them in the simple language. I will just place them on the table, right? right? And then I will just tune into that, to use my body to tune into that. 
So this is where all the indigenous wisdom comes. This is where, you know, uh, this is where the surprise comes at. Oh, the body knows. Of course the body knows. The body knows what's happening. You know, it, you sometimes you walk into a room and we just know that something drastic has happened and it's yes. best to just keep quiet. The body knows, right? So you yes. use the body to tune into it. Like in your own case right now, maybe you can try this offline. You have, um, so you use, you have put both of these partners here in, on the table, which is a field of information. And you just, you just tune, you just tune into, tune into it with the body. You tune into one and you see what you're feeling in the body, what emotions are coming, what thoughts are coming, what words are coming. It sounds crazy, but it's mm -hmm. naturally not crazy. And so you do that with both of them and you, and you see if you can bring them together. In most cases, like in this particular case, you, you know, when you tune into individual partners, we hear anger, we hear rage, we hear things exactly similar to what they would be saying in real time. So some, mm -hmm. like in, in, my, in my case, I wouldn't know this, I don't know this couple at all. I just met them in the session and right. I heard exactly what they are saying to each other when they are, you know, fighting on top of their lungs in, in their home. And they're completely surprised that how do I know? Am I reading their yeah. mind? I'm not reading their mind. It's all of that energy is there in the field. It's there in the living universe inside of them and inside of me. And if you just pay attention, you know. Yeah. So I paid attention and I got to know that that's what's happening. And then I see that there is something between them that they are not really able to come together. They're not really able to look at each other. So then I would use, you know, another two set of uh, people which is partner is mother and partner is uh, father. And then another two set of dolls to build out the other partner's parents. And I keep building that and I keep tuning into, uh, tuning into each person until I get to see a pattern, wow. right? Um, until I get to see the pattern and until I get to see what lies between these, this couple and why they are not able to come. So it could be that uh, one of the couple is not, one of the person is not even looking at the partner because they are so, uh, they are so busy being employed by their system. They're so busy putting their biological system into order. They are so busy serving all the dysfunctional loyalties and just looking at all the suffering of the past in their system that they're not actually even looking at their partner. Amazing. And so a lot of times the rage and the anger comes at the partner because you are inviting me to come here and be in the present with you. And I don't have time. Yeah. I'm looking at the past. I'm too busy. You know, stop bugging me. Stop nagging me. These little words that we say to each other in real life can actually mean something so different yeah. when you look at it systemically. So once you see all of that, once the truth is seen, that itself is very settling to the body. Because then suddenly... <laughs> And generally, how long does that process take? Does that happen in a session? Does that happen in a month? Does that happen sometimes six months? Does it take, everybody's different, but generally yeah. how long does it take to associate where that pattern comes from and how to start to resolve it? Um, I mean, I would say the first session, the typical session would take somebody a good two to three hours. Wow. Right, a constellation is usually that long when it's done right and it's done uh, and you have addressed all the pieces, it's bound to take that long. Yeah. Um, I also see that, I also know that some people can are brilliant at what they do in short amount of time and they are very kind to the nervous system of the person and they, you know, they wouldn't really open everything up in a session and they just go small pieces one at a time. I think that pattern, that, that approach can also work well. And then in that multiple sessions to address all the pieces. Um, I am for some reason not able to take that approach. Right. So, um, you know, so what I do offer is I offer different levels of working with me. Uh, so if somebody is new, that person, that person can work with me on a monthly basis and we start slow eventually to build and to go really deep into the system. Or if somebody has done a lot of work and is just sitting with one one situation and has built the capacity in their nervous system to go really deep, I can take them deep right away in the first session. Beautiful. Uh, so there are, there are different options that one can work with. So clearly, 
you can feel in the integrity of Sima here, the, the work that she does. And, clear, and so if you are a person right now who has tried with everything you have to turn around something that just isn't working in your life, maybe it's time for you to think about the possibility that you're not pulling the root out of of the weed that you're that you're uh priming priming you're you're cutting off something or trying to work on something that is not the solution and that the roots of it go further into your ancestral heritage and that until you go to that place where you can see where it actually got started that it will it won't release and so seem if someone wants to to start to do this work with you, mm -hmm. where would they go to start to get that? And how would, how would be the best way they could research you online or talk to you or whatever? How does that work? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, the best place would be to go to my website, which is innerconstellations.com. And um, I have uh, described all the different levels that I can work with someone on my website. Uh, and there's also more information about my bio. Uh, so that can give somebody, you can read that and you can just tune in and see if I'm the right fit to lead you because the right fit really is important. And so there are, and then there are multiple options. Like I mentioned, somebody, you could come to me just for a simple um, energy healing session. You could come to me for a constellation session, which goes about three hours long. Yeah. You could work with me on, um, with, on a monthly basis. Um, I, um, I do all this work right now online because of the coronavirus situation. Um, yeah. Earlier, I would love to do in person, but I think, you know, virtual is good for now. And um, so that would be one way. And another, another uh, easy way to, you know, taste this work is I'm offering an introduction to this workshop, you know, to this work, a four-hour workshop sometime in June. Um, that's an introduction workshop. It's a, uh, it's an easy, it's an easy way to get your feet wet and to Perfect. learn more about uh, the work. Um, and my intention in that workshop would be that even though it's an introduction workshop, to have um, have folks map out their family tree so that at least you can start seeing the pattern. And then, if nothing else, you leave with one one clear insight that it didn't start with you and it's not your fault. Love it. Love it. I hope people will do what she said. I hope you'll go and check her out. I hope you'll start to look at it. I always end the podcast by asking the same question. It's the only question I always ask. And it's this question. When you look out the window at the world you see, and I'm not talking about coronavirus now, because that, <laughs> okay. that, that, will, that will be something that we'll remember for the rest of our lives, but will one day pass. So you can either yeah. talk pre-corona or post-corona. Is this the world that you always dreamed that you would want to hand over to your children and your children's children? Without a shadow of a doubt. Without a shadow. Without a shadow of doubt, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay, so will you be so kind to share that world that you see? Because so many people say without a shadow of a doubt, no. Will you be so kind to share what you see? And one okay. thing that you could tell people that would help them to see the world the way you see it so that they can say without a shadow of a doubt too. That's exactly what I'm doing in my life. I yeah. keep sharing what I see so that we see more and we see, we learn to see better. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Seema, I want to thank you for being here. I just want to summarize for just one moment. For those of you who have come, one of the th reasons that I love this podcast is we meet people that we wouldn't normally meet in our day-to-day -day life. And one of the things that I've seen from the mosaic point of view is that the way we look at something determines what we see. Yeah. And if we only see, continue to look at things the same way we see, we've always been looking at things will most likely continue to see the same things we've always seen. And that's great if everything in life is working for you just the way you want it to. But most of the people I come in contact with, and it might just be that they come in contact with me because they're a peculiar breed. 
if you see the world exactly the way you want to see it and you're happy in the way I say hallelujah to you and, and don't do a thing. Just continue doing what you're doing. But if you're looking at your life and you're seeing some things that you just, they're just out of your reach. You just can't understand it. You've put in a lot of energy to try and change it, fix it, adapt it, be open up to something new. And it just doesn't seem to be making the shift that you want. I can't recommend to you highly enough that you get in touch with Sina. That you go to her website. The links are all right there. will be all there in the show notes. That you engage her in conversation. That you go to her this webinar that she's talking about giving. That you learn more about it. Because how amazing would it be if everything that's happening is just ancestral and you could heal some of those ancestral links you could let go of them you could maybe i'm not so sure i'm probably not saying it right but that you could either cut the cord or heal the cord of what it is so that you no longer have to hand it down to future generations and that you can now like sima said she didn't even meet her father but she became her father because that that pocket was open and she was born right into it well, at a certain point, wouldn't it be great to give honor to your father and love and respect to your father, but to become yourself as well? If you want to still continue to honor your ancestors, which we all want to do, but honor them by eliminating the chain of suffering that's been brought through some of that, I want to sit in this hole with you because I want to love you, but I want to change the place that I sit so we no longer have to suffer anymore. And in honor to you and in love to you, I want to do that with you. How beautiful would that be? So beautiful. So I can't recommend enough that you contact her, that you go to the website. Seema, I want to thank you so much for your time here with us and for sharing this beautiful gift, for being here in the world, for people to find you. And is there anything that I haven't let you say that you wanted to say that you said, oh boy, I just really wanted to say that. Well, I think that's, that's good for our first conversation. So I, I think, think both have said enough. I think so. Um, you know, I want to express my gratitude and my honor to you as well to, for inviting me here and for your listeners that, um, that they would be offering their time, their valuable time, their energy and their presence um, to both you and I when they listen to this. So, Absolutely. you know, deep gratitude for trusting us and for taking a chance to listen to this conversation. And I wish you all so much peace and love and love. Thank you, Seema. And thank you to all of my Mosaic family who um, comes and listens. If you like this podcast, please be kind enough to share it with your friends, rate and review it. Uh, it would, it would just, it just helps more people to know about it and learn about it. And The beauty of the people that I introduce you to is that they're available to you. Contact them. And please join us again next time when we have the Mosaic podcast and subscribe so you know when they are. I'm, I'm not a traditional guy, so nothing I do. It's not like every Wednesday I come out. I come out when I come out. And, <laughs> and we come out sometimes in a flurry and sometimes not for a while. So the best way to know what's going on is subscribe to us and you'll get the updates again thank you for your time thank you for your love thank you Seema thank you people um, until next time God bless you thank you everyone